Welcome to Strategies for Getting the Parts You Need in 2022 and Beyond. Did you ever think you would see a time when something like 3600A drums were hard to get or even unavailable? I certainly didn't think so. The pandemic and geo instability, geopolitical instability has definitely caused some, some real problems. We've seen raw materials being unavailable. And even if the raw materials are available, then once the parts are produced, getting them to where they need to get has been problematic. And our supply chain is just not as robust as maybe we thought it was. And so everyone's facing this challenge right now. And the big question is, what should repair technicians who work at either repair shops or at fleets do to get the parts they need and keep those trucks and trailers rolling? My name is Jamie Irvin. I'm the host of the Heavy Duty Parts Report. And I've worked in the heavy duty truck and trailer parts business since 1998 at every level, manufacturing, distribution, and uh, retail. And uh, I'm also the host of the Heavy Duty Parts Report, where we talk about these kinds of issues quite regularly on the show. Today, I get the privilege of being your moderator, and we've got a great panel discussion for you today. Unfortunately, Greg Arsenal is not able to be here on camera, but he is here on the phone, so we'll be able to hear from him. Now, Greg is the National Sales Director of Ambeck International. Ambeck International is a 110-year-old company. They manufacture fuel injection parts for commercial equipment, and they also manufacture other parts related to commercial vehicles. Greg has an engineering degree and over 40 years of experience. Greg, welcome to our discussion today. Thank you, Jamie. Keith Evans is the Senior Vice President and General Manager at Truck Supply Company of South Carolina. This company was founded in 1965. In 2003, there was an ownership change And the company really moved towards being an award-winning distributor, winning distributor of the year in that year. They offer over 375 years of combined experience with all of the people who work for them on the parts counter. So they know parts inside and out. And Keith Evans, he is someone who is, uh, his journey began in the trucking industry in 1986. And he is a passionate guy, both about the industry, but more importantly, his family and his church. He also loves motorcycles and fast cars, so he is a gearhead through and through. Keith, welcome to our roundtable discussion. Thank you, Jamie. All right, and our third person that we are talking to today is Adam Sadler. He's the Vice President of Sales and Marketing at Sadler Powertrain Truck Parts and Service. Uh, They have four locations. They're a family-owned and operated truck parts and service provider in Iowa. Their company started in 1974. And they have grown the business exponentially over the last decade, both uh, through a combination of diversifying what they sell and also by adding B2C and B2B e-commerce sites. And Adam, uh, for the past 14 years, his role has been the director of e-commerce and the VP of sales and marketing. And so he's been a big reason why their company has been so successful. Adam, welcome to our roundtable discussion. Very, very happy to have you here. Thanks, Jamie. Glad to be here. You guys all sent me a lot of information about your, you personally and your companies. I hope I represented as well as possible. But you know, people are on the program today to uh, really, they, they want to see this presentation and, and hear this discussion because there's big problems in the supply chain and getting parts. And, and hopefully they're going to learn something today from all of us that will help them with their business. So let's get right you know, it's always important to start at the beginning. What caused the part shortages and the supply chain disruption? Maybe we can add a little bit of context to that. I think people in, you know, on a macro level, they know, but let me ask you something, Greg, from a manufacturer's perspective, uh, when did you start to see disruption in the access uh, to raw materials? Well, in actuality, we don't import a lot of raw material. Most of the of the components that we do, we manufacture uh, from start to finish in-house. So we have not been affected as if it was raw material, where we're starting to see um, bits and piece component parts. Um, and it's been probably about 10 months since we've really seen it. Um, and a lot of that is there are so many container ships that are out in the harbor, all those container ships are filled with containers and there's actually a shortage of containers, which is driving the price up as well as just plugging up the works as far as getting stuff moving back and forth from uh, any offshore destination into the United States. 
Greg, you you compete against a lot of manufacturers. I know in conversation with you, you've you've mentioned that other manufacturers have had issues with getting access to raw materials. So when did that start for them? And was it strictly just an issue of the pandemic and and people locking down that first lockdown that did it, or is there more going you know more to the story than just that? Well, I think there is more to the story. Um, it it started um, really about fourteen months ago is when we really started. And, and it depended on how much buffer stock people had either in their own facility or on the way to them. Um, and if you were, you know, I think really just in time inventory has turned into just in case inventory. We're seeing people that are trying to put in orders larger than what they need because they don't know when they're going to get the order filled again. So that is an issue that's happening as well. But even besides that, there's an issue in, especially in LA, where uh, the drayage, moving the product from the container ship to actually the warehouse, that's all done by mom and pop organizations. And they are so stacked up right now, they can't make any money. And California is dictating that by 2024, they have to use all electric vehicles. And none of those people can afford to buy a new truck. So this isn't going to go away anytime soon. The, the fastest way around that portion is to move and, and use another port outside of California where you're not going to have those restrictions. And I, I have talked to several people who are using um, either Texas or they're switching over to the East Coast and going to Savannah or Baltimore. So let's shift gears a little bit. Keith, from a yeah. distributor's perspective, uh, when did you start to experience the disruption to your parts supply and, and how bad has it gotten for you? Well, we noticed uh, early on, uh, we participate in a lot of the industry uh, boards and things such here, Edward, being on some of the advisory boards, me coming from corporate America, being on it. So we started getting kind of the input around the June, July 2020 that there was going to be shortages, of course, just like, you know, we're speaking about the ships were on the water, not being able to be unloaded. So about September, we all sat down as a business and basically said, things are going to really change. We're dealing with a pandemic. You know, you had the issue of employees. You had the suppliers starting to say, you know, we need to ramp up. We need to do this. So around November 2020, we pulled the strings and started ramping our inventory up. Uh, we increased our inventory probably about 450000 half a million dollars to prepare for because we heard it was coming. And when it came, it was going to stick for a long time. So we started and we kept going uh, throughout 2021 and we kind of started pulling back. And about time we pulled back, you guys seen what happened towards the third quarter of last year. We started seeing that shortage getting even worse. Even when the containers started hitting the ports, the freight amounts were going through the roof. So it was more beneficial to continue to buy in bulk. So we continued and ramped back up. But uh, the biggest success was when we noticed that back in September of 2020. So, Adam, what's been your experience? Uh, I'm, I'm sure this is all ringing true to you. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I had the same note there. Late 2020 is, is really where we started to see it. And, and it was more to what Greg was saying. How much inventory did you have on the shelf? How much did you have coming in? Um, so it probably had a different feel for different distributors across the country. Uh, but that's really where we saw it. What compounded it for us is we had a damage to our building. So we lost inventory space. We lost 3,000 square feet of our building. So we ended up uh, purchasing trailers and we ended up, we've stored our inventory on trailers the last two years. Certain inventory you can, certain inventory you can't. Um, but you got to do what you got to do in this time. Like we had no other option. We didn't want to go off site with the inventory. So we've got the trailers and, you know, we, we put more of a, uh, you know, some of the minimizer products, something that's a, that's a poly product, you know, that's not going to be affected by, you know, if, if water or anything gets in there, but, you know, we, we've had uh, three containers of drums on order uh, from a Turkish manufacturer for over a year, the 3,600 a equivalent drum over a year as of this week. Um, so we've had to go back to other suppliers like web and gunite and try and get our drums. But now what the problem is, is you have these guys doing allocation. So they're saying, okay, now you can only purchase what you purchased from us last year for total drums. So we're in a really tough spot with that drum and other things uh, from this allocation point of view, because there's lots of companies besides 
Web and Gunite and Dana and others that are doing this allocation. Yeah, yeah. We were at a trade show recently and I saw a, a complete drum. It wasn't like a cutaway. It was like an actual complete drum on the on the desk. And I said, I cannot believe you guys brought this and, and haven't sold it. And they said, trust yeah. me, people have actually issued a PO right here at our booth because they'll take that one drum because it's gotten that bad. So right. let's shift let's shift gears um, and talk about the overall impact on the customers, right? The fleets and the owner operators. Uh, Keith, can you tell us a story about the impact of not getting a part? Like, what impact does that have on on a on an individual customer? Because th- they're the ones that that really are feeling it. Yeah, it's it's devastating. Um, we're fortunate because uh, we have, of course, our parts distribution center, so we've tied it into our service department. So basically, my technicians and service riders can pull parts from within the house, but still, there's you know you can't have everything. So. Um, with that being said, it's just one recently we had that just keeps sticking in the mind, but we basically ordered a fifth wheel, had a customer bought a new truck, brought it in for us to put a slider fifth wheel on versus a stationary. And from the time we ordered it until it got here, the customer's vehicle set for six weeks. And when it got here, uh, it actually set in Nashville, Tennessee for two weeks on the loading dock because the freight company was short on drivers. So it was a hiccup from the time we ordered it until the time it finally made it here. And then when it made it here, they didn't drill the slider. So we had to drill the slider. So it turned into a little over six and a half weeks to get the customer's uh, truck up and running and operational. And with the way trucks are running today, the business, uh, it was pretty devastating. So we've learned to really smooth talk a whole lot. But (laughs) at the end of the day, it's all about educating the customers and it has turned significantly in the last year year and a half with the customers because they understand the price increases even though they don't like them uh and they also understand the delivery part but it's still difficult and we continue to educate them every day that it's going to get worse before it gets better right adam what's one of the more desperate things you've seen customers do to try to deal with this I was asking a few guys uh, at the shop about this. And I, the one that stuck out to me was, you know, I actually took a phone call, a parts counter call from this guy. And he, he found us online and was looking for a filter, Baldwin filter that no one had. He was in the mat- north of Madison, Wisconsin. So it's about a three hour round trip to Cedar Rapids, Iowa from Madison. And as soon as I told him that we had six on the shelf, he said, I'll be there in three hours. This is a $20 filter. He had to have it to get that truck going. He came all the way from Madison, bought six. He only needed one because he didn't know when he was going to be able to get that filter again because Baldwin said there was no ETA. So guys are doing that constantly, you know, and they're just desperate to get their vehicle back on the road and they'll do it by any means necessary. You know, that guy, I think I got a customer for life because he keeps calling back looking for other things that he can't find somewhere else. So um, there is challenges, but there's opportunities during times like these, too. So um, we're we're trying to look at it and focus on, OK, what can we control and what can we do in this time where people are looking for partners and suppliers that can help them? Yeah. And like to your point, it's a $20 part, but I mean, that's a filter for an engine or for uh, something in the drive trade or, or whatever. So uh, that, that has to go to keep the truck moving. And uh, if the, you know, if that truck doesn't go, it's all that downtime, it's lost revenue. Maybe he loses right. a customer, uh, the lifetime value of a customer. All of a sudden this thing, this thing that starts off costing you 20 bucks for the purchase price of the part is something that costs, potentially has the ability to cost him tens of thousands of dollars. Absolutely. So Greg, you know, you sell through distribution. So, you know, you are talking to people nationally. Um, Is this regional, national? Are are these stories resonating with you of what you're hearing all over the the country? No, they're, they're happening all over the place. And that, and that's why I said um, exactly what Kevin was talking about just in time has turned into just in case. So like what Adam said, the guy bought six when he only needed one. Um, I was actually um, down at my largest customers um, two weeks ago, and I, I proposed to them a little bit different way of doing business. The problem that we have is because we remanufacture uh, injectors is probably the biggest part of what we do. Well, when you remand anything, your raw material is your core. So now I'm starting to see, and I'm looking forward a little bit, but I see 
a harbinger of, of problems with core because the more people will take like those six filters, he's got five of them sitting on his shelf. That's five of them that, that no one else can get. Well, if that's a core item, uh, filters disposable, but if those are sets of injectors, pretty soon you run into a core shortage. And we're actually seeing for the very first time a shortage in core that's kind of across the board. Um, you ordinarily in the life cycle, when it first is introduced, there's a shortage because there just aren't any out there yet. And then at the end of the life, sometimes when it takes more than one core to make a finished good, you have a problem then too. But we're seeing this problem now. So basically what we've done is just like what Kevin and Adam were saying, we're going to dictate how things are sold. So in other words, I'll sell to your DC. And then from your DC, we call it hub and spoke. So the DC is the hub then the stores can pull off of the DC so that the product will move through the DC faster and we will get the core back. I, we can't afford to have people having sets of injectors sitting on their shelf just waiting for them to be sold because that's the raw material that I need to bring the next set out. So it is a little bit of an issue and uh, people are starting to see this happen. So uh, so far, there have not been any any problems with people saying, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm buying everything I can get um, because that's the other side of the coin. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, the trucking industry is the backbone of society. And um, the, the issues that we have in the trucking industry are often whether we're doing well or we're struggling. It's like a it's like the canary in the coal mine, right? It's a, it's a precursor to what happens in in our economy on a, on a larger scale. What is your thoughts on how these challenges that we're having when the trucks can't go? Uh, an example, for example, is um, if we don't have enough drivers and, the, and then there's trucks being parked in yards because they don't have parts, those vehicles aren't able to deliver goods. That, that's having an impact on inflation. That's having an impact on you know, much larger societal issues. How, how do you guys view that? Kind of, let's just open up round table here. That is a huge issue right now. Um, if you look at, um, I was listening to Covenant Transportation give a talk a little while ago. They have about 2,500 uh, trailers on the road. What they said is that ordinarily they have about 3% of their trucks and their trailers are in for regular service. Well, that number is now 10% because they're waiting for parts. So you have shortages of drivers. You also, and, and you know what, when you're paying people to sit at home, they're not out looking for work. So there's a, a nationwide shortage of help all over the place. You have that aspect going on. Then you have the parts aspect. If the guy's trailer is down because he can't get brake drums, then that's one more unit off the road. So now you're seeing a stockpile of goods. And, um, you know, just like Kevin and Adam were both saying, if, if you're waiting much longer for the shipment to get there, um, you know, that everybody is seeing that. And we're seeing that regardless of whether it's a delivery of component parts or whether it's a delivery of finished goods, it, it all comes down to the same thing. The transportation industry is, is taking a hit and therefore the economy is going to take a hit as well because you can't, you can't get the parts. Sense to me. Yeah. It's a little different down in here in South Carolina where we're at. Our biggest vocation is dump trucks. We do a significant amount of business walking on the counter. I mean, you can literally have 10 to 15 deep in the showroom waiting to get parts. Literally what we're experiencing here is people who are, can't find used vehicles to drive. Of course, we know what's going on with the new. They're literally pulling vehicles out of the weeds to run them. They're bringing them to our service department. And of course, if we can't get parts for a 2019 Freightliner, it's sure hard to get the parts for a 1988 Ford F-650. So <laughs> right now it's completely you know, out of, out of rim and the balance there is just, it's unbelievable. But the thing is, is that still at the end of the day, we're keeping a large percentage of those trucks on the road. We're also tasked with the fact that with us being in Columbia, South Carolina, we have the port of Charleston and also the port of Savannah. So we're dealing with a lot of those drivers coming through. And right now that's a very hot business. So these guys are running their trucks longer than they want to anticipate because they just don't want to stop. So when they stop, they need us to immediately jump on their trucks. But when you've got a backlog of trucks, uh, it's hard to, to keep up with it. So the business is there. Adam, you had something you wanted to say? Yeah, the, the business, the opportunities are, are definitely there. Um, I was going to mention something about pulling it out of the weeds too. We've, 
we've we've seen more old cat engines being pulled out of the weeds. Uh, I can't even tell you how much of that we became a, a cat tough dealer here within the last few months, and I can't tell you how many of these guys are pulling pulling these old ones out of the, these um, farmers' yards and old old dump trucks and and bringing them in and saying, "Hey, or throw this in this chassis because I can't get a new truck." You know, they're just trying to get something that they can run. Um, so there's there's opportunities there, and the other the other thing that we've seen is the the guys that are running, the guys that are are moving and trying to keep moving, they are looking for us to be their parts partner. They're just giving us a list of parts or emailing us and saying, go get it. They're not even asking about price. They're not asking about anything else. Just take care of this list and get it done. So we're having opportunities to get new sales opportunities for parts that we may never sold this customer before because he's busy trying to do something else. So we've had opportunities and that's one of the reasons we reached out to Cat and said, hey, we can be a delivery partner for you. They're not delivering anywhere. Everybody has to come pick it up from them. So we had all these new opportunities coming in. So we're a Cummins dealer, we're a Cat dealer, and we're able to go out and deliver and distribute to these customers now because they're just trying to take care of something else where they would have gone to Cat or Cummins before. They're coming to us and just saying, here, go get it and get it to me. Uh, so Joshua Day, uh, thanks for your question. He says, um, has or will the silicon chip shortage impact the diesel industry? So is it going to impact the diesel industry? Things like control modules, things like that. And if it is, what should Reman do to get prepared for that? So let's break that down first. Um, what's your thoughts, Keith, what's your thoughts on on the shortage of chips and, and how that's impacted the diesel industry? What have you seen? Haven't seen really much effect there. I think we're seeing more of the hard parts, the breaking parts that the issues are there. Uh, of course, you know, we've talked about drums since we kicked this off. And, you know, the, the word on the street is now it's not necessarily the price of the drum, which has increased dramatically. I would think it was 30 cent on the pound, which you take the price or the weight of a drum. That's a significant price. Now the question is, are we going to be able to even get brake drums by the end of the year? So I think we're going to see more there, and and I see that the new truck hold up when I get the daily uh, report <clears throat> is not going out. Everybody's pretty much cutting their orders right now. Um, I think what we're going to see is that used truck market, the second, third owner, uh, is going to be really where we see a lot of our business coming in right now. Adam, your thoughts on that? Yeah, we haven't really seen much of that. Um it has an, we do deal with the light duty market um, a little bit as well, vans and trucks um, on the half ton to, to one ton range. But, you know, guys are keeping stuff longer. And we're in an area, we're in Iowa, so we're in an agricultural area. So we're kind of used to guys keeping keeping trucks around for a long time anyways. Um, but it, we really haven't haven't seen that as far as the heavy duty industry so where, where I've seen it is in um, sensors, uh, the diesel emission systems, um, like NOx sensors and things like that, that became a bit problematic at, at one point. I know one of our, uh, my clients is a manufacturer of those. And he said that, you know, basically every single one of his competitors bought from him because he was fortunate enough to have inventory when this all started. So I think maybe on the sensors, mm-hmm. maybe on... Um, uh, new truck manufacturing, obviously, that's going to have an impact. That is what's holding back some of the the production of new vehicles. So, if in the uh, aftermarket, you know, maybe we maybe we don't feel it at all, or or we only feel it a little bit. Maybe in three four years, we feel it in a big way. It's hard to say. A um, couple co- more questions coming in here that I think are relevant. So, uh, we got a a question from Timber Tinner. He says, do most of you seem to be having issues with plastic parts, metal parts, or electronic? Texas seems to be missing plastic parts. I know, for example, Grody had to temporarily change the color of the backing on one of their lights because they ran out of black resin. So what's what's yeah. been the experience there? Um, I'll kick that over to you, Keith. I uh, hadn't seen really much issues here. Uh, a lot of plastic stuff we do with the reservoir stuff, we're not having issues with it. But again, we're learning that everything changes every day, uh, if not every week, definitely. Uh, we haven't really noticed anything. You talked about the knock sensors. I have seen an issue with the quality of knock sensors uh, that comes to mind right offhand. We've gone through a couple of different vendors. Again, when we get in crisis like this, we go back to uh, business 101, you know, supply versus demand. So uh, 
quality is going to be the biggest issues I think we're going to see at this point, but I've not really seen any shortages with those components. Uh, Paul Connolly brought, brought in a question, but Paul, I'm going to uh, save your question until our next segment because it's relevant there. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Don't have a heavy duty part number and need to look up a part? Go to parts.diesellaptops.com or download the app on Apple or Android to create your free account. Looking for high-quality fuel injection for heavy-duty applications? Having one supplier for fuel injection allows you to better serve customers by providing them with a complete line, which increases your sales and profitability. Learn more at ambacinternational.com slash aftermarket. I think we've, we've established there is a problem, kind of what some of the causes were, how bad it's gotten, the impact it's having. Let's talk about shifting in, in buying behavior. So, Paul... You asked uh, specifically because this question came from something Adam said. Adam, you mentioned that you are seeing new customers come to you and say, help me find this part. Um, He's curious, like, where are you going and how are you sourcing parts without giving away your secret sauce? Obviously, what strategies are you employing? So we're going to get to the strategies in a minute. But let's talk a little bit first about the first half of that question in shifting buying behavior. Adam, because you've got an e-commerce, strong e-commerce presence, are you 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 probably have a really good view of of how buyers of parts are kind of changing so what changes in buying behavior have you seen a lot i mean we're 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 seeing guys buy huge bulk uh online and if we get um it, having our b2b and b2c we're having a lot of exposure of our inventory and we actually show the number of of parts that we have for that particular SKU. Um, and we don't let them buy anything more than what we have. Um, so we're getting inquiries beyond the amount of inventory that we have. So say we have 50 of a harness on the shelf. They want to know if they can get 500 because they're either behind or they want to stay ahead. One of the two. So we're seeing a lot of that. We're getting just run out of thing. You can kind of see it happening. You, you'll see because we're on different uh, marketplace channels as well. So Amazon, eBay. Uh, in our web stores, you can start to see a run on something and it just goes like that. So we have to kind of pull back a buffer, a little bit of buffer inventory for our own uh, brick and mortar stores, our service shops. So I keep a really close eye on how the orders, I see every order that comes in uh, through the e-commerce channel. So I really try to keep a close eye on that. Um, but that's the biggest thing. We're getting inquiries from everywhere and anywhere i'm talking worldwide um guys are just looking for for a new new source or a new partner because they're maybe their first or second source isn't able to help them uh keith before the pandemic started i was a big uh advocate let's say of of digital technology and i had a lot of conversations with a lot of companies leading up to the pandemic and there was a lot of pushback you know there's a lot of well you know it's good for the automotive industry i don't know if it'll ever work for our industry how has your viewpoint changed over the last couple of years with everything that you've experienced when it comes to, you know, the way that people have been more willing to adopt digital sales channels and e-commerce and their shifting buying behavior? Have, have, has you, have you had a, a change in opinion on that or, or did this like reinforce something you already were thinking? Well, it's, it's, I'm actually about 50, 50 there because again, the, the, the demographics for us are totally different where, you know, uh, Adam has the e-commerce. He works well with there. Here, we have more one-on-one touch with the customer. So, you know, with our inventory, you know, I've noticed uh, the comments have been said. We, we're we basically taking care of our marketplace and those customers that are in here every day and taking care of them more than going out to the e-commerce because my biggest fear was if I opened up e-commerce, I wasn't going to be able to support my customer base to count it on us every day. And so with that, it's made us more strategic in our territory that everybody knew us instead of expanding outside of that area right now, which they're greatly appreciative to us for that. And they show their loyalty by continuously coming back. Um, But at the end of the day, we also have to monitor it because everybody's learning and understanding this shortage. So as I as we heard earlier, if I've got 10 on the shelf and they come in and say they want 10, I may have a hard time getting them. So I may have to limit it. So our yeah. bottom line is, is there's just so much walk in business that we take care of that local market. 
so Greg, I know from a manufacturing perspective, you're dealing with distributors, but um, they're, they're shifting in their buying behavior too. And certainly there's been an uptick in demand for like a B2B e-commerce solution. Is that what you're finding uh, with your, your distributors as well? Are they, are they reacting to some of this with a, with a more will, you know, a greater willingness to adopt a digital sales channel? They are. And, uh, the, the problem, um, that we have, and of course you're, we're working with you as a consultant. So, you know, uh, you know, what's going on within our company, but one of the issues is that, um, everybody wants to see the inventory that you have on hand. Well, when you're talking finished goods and it's a, uh, like a pass through type operation, um, that's pretty straightforward. But when you're in a manufacturing uh, situation, you could have three on the shelf, but you have six uh, WIP work in progress. So um, showing the inventory becomes a little bit problematic. And it goes back to what both Keith and Adam were, were both saying, that people are stocking up. That just in case is, is, um, is really true. I mean, they're, they're buying even though they don't need it. And we're starting to have to regulate that. I, I don't know any other way that you can do that. So even though it's great to open up a new sales channel, um, it it is only great if you can get everything that you need. Yeah, it's going to be interesting after the uh, supply chain catches up. That could be two, three years from now, but whenever it does, uh, it's going to be interesting to see if some of these shifting buying behaviors last or if some people go back or, you know, like maybe Adam gets a whole bunch of new customers during this time and then he keeps those customers that he never had before um, because uh, now they're familiar with doing business with him and uh, they find it's very easy. And so they keep buying. I mean, obviously, Adam, that's your hope, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we we timing wise, it was really good for us. We launched a new B2B platform uh, in October of 2019. Um, so we saw a 300% increase in our online purchases from our account customers. Uh, so then just our B2C, our B2C site had been launched for over a decade and we've seen year over year growth the last two years, 30 to 40% growth on our B2C. So it, it's exploded and we've gained a lot of new customers in that way. And we've really kept up with it. We've doubled and tripled, quadrupled our order points to keep up with demand. Um, and you're not always going to have everything that everybody needs, but the biggest thing for us is we, we don't take the back orders. We don't allow the customer to purchase more than what we have on hand. So we don't have all that maintenance of all these back orders. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I want to get to, uh, Paul's, the second half of his question where he was saying, what strategies are you employing to source parts that you haven't had to do in the past or so so you're expanding your supplier network in other words so let's talk about that recommended strategies for repair shops and fleets when they're looking at expanding their uh supplier network uh, adam what recommendations do you have to someone who's going to expand their supplier network let's talk about some of the red flags they should look out for yeah i mean it, we're doing the same thing i mean we're we're looking for new opportunities as well so i mean we have new customers coming in and suppliers are having new customers, you know, because they can't get uh, parts from their primary source. So I guess, first of all, if you're interested in a new supplier, I would uh, first ask if they're even taking on new distributorship, you know, new, new, new customers. Cause some, some of the ones that we've contacted, they say, yeah, we're interested, but not right now. We, we can't supply our current, uh, distributors with products. We don't want to put more pressure on their own supply chain. So, uh, I mean, doing some inquiry like that, and then, you know, basically find out if they have any surcharges or handling fees or things like that. And when's the last time they did a price increase? Um, and do they notify you of price increases or is it just a dynamic thing that just happens and they don't notify you? Cause everybody operates a little bit differently. Um, you know, there's, there's people, distributors within, you know, our Vipar buying network that, uh, have increased pricing via surcharge and some just increase the price. So they feel like they can bring off that surcharge once things settle down. So asking some of those questions to start out with, um, you know, just as far as the pricing goes, because you might get in with a new, new supplier and they might have a price increase coming in a month. So you think, hey, I'm going to switch over and I'm going to have a better price with this guy. Well, 
you might not, you might have it for one month, but it's not going to last. So definitely inquire about some of those things to get started out with and just really find, find somebody you can partner with. I mean, that's what we really want to do is, is partner with people and be their supplier. Just be the, the one call last call. Keith, I, I got kind of two parts to my question for you. So one, you already talked a little bit, you alluded to it, like with sensors, um, there's a shift in quality because of, of how bad the, the supply, the shortage is. So then all of a sudden they're, they're trying to source things from different places. So how important is really making sure that your supplier is going to give you a quality product? I know it's a kind of silly question, but I mean, this stuff is happening and we got to watch out for it. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, just I, I key into that by simply saying that the our suppliers that we've always dealt with, you know, since uh, Edward acquired the company in 2003, is his stern focus has always been about building that relationship with that vendor, making that relationship. So this is the, these would be the type of times that that would really be utilized. So you got to stay strong with the vendors that have really taken care of you and you build a relationship with. But at the same time, when you have that relationship, you should be able to, with no problem, which we have no issue, we go back to those vendors and say, hey, we've got a quality issue. And um, they, the vendors that we deal with do an excellent job of stepping up and uh, making it forth. Uh, we've had one case where they couldn't. And uh, they basically said, hey, until we can figure it out, you guys do what you have to do, but we'll be here for you. We're going to get a resolution. So that's the type of relationships you got to have right now. You got to continue to have those relationships and really make those things strong and, and continue to carry us through the storm. Yeah, and uh, certainly, I mean, the traditional distribution model that we've used for decades has has its uh, strengths. Um, but I'd also say that you can develop that kind of relationship through a digital relationship as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it really comes down to what when when the chips are down what do they do right and and is is there an easy way to deal with them are they going to stand up and and take care of you like these are questions you got to ask some tough questions because i mean right now people if they've got some inventory the question might not be uh how much it is or when can you ship it but why do you have that inventory well, exactly. right there might be a reason you got to get to the bottom of that exactly yeah. i've seen a big shift in brand loyalty and people moving away from asking for specific brands, especially the last couple of years. If, if it's not available, they, they don't really, they're not going to move on. Uh, they're just asking for, Hey, do you have an 89 dryer? You know, they're not asking specifically for the premium brand. Like maybe they used to. It's, it's really, it's really shifted. I haven't, we haven't heard too much ask about price or about brand in the last couple of years. That, that opens point. us up to to some issues, though, in the in the long term, and that's where I think some of this is going to have to balance out. Because um, I understand that something is better than nothing, but if your margins are starting to uh, erode as a fleet because now your total cost of operation and your cost per mile is going up because you're you know you're just taking whatever parts you can get and those parts are failing in six months instead of eighteen, that's going to have an impact downstream. So. There's got to be a balance point, but I guess as long as demand is out, outpacing supply, uh, maybe it just it, it doesn't matter right now because something's better than nothing. What do you think? Yeah, it depends. It depends on the quality of, of the manufacturer, really. I mean, we've we've gone through and we've we've brought in different distributors and different types of parts. And we have found ones that, you know, we've had to get out and we've had ones that have really taken off. And we've really tried to go coreless. That's like our been our big move in the last couple of years. We went cordless on brake shoes. We're going as many cordless compressors and alternators and starters as possible to give somebody a new option. Because a lot of times, you know, they were, you know, having trouble getting the core back to you anyways. So, I mean, it, it really comes down to, yeah, you, you might, it might not be the premium name, but it's still a high, high quality product. There's some, so there's some second tier suppliers out there that do have some very good uh, quality product that maybe this is giving people the opportunity to try that they maybe didn't before. Um, that's actually a really good point because what, what the sales has done, and I'll give you an example. Cummins right now has $9 billion of parts worldwide on back order, and that includes everything. But what that means is that if somebody can step in and fill a niche, 
Um, because like you said, this isn't Aunt Nellie's car that you can wait for the parts to come in. This is a guy who's earning his living with this truck. So they got to plug the hole and, and they don't want cheap stuff. But if cheap stuff is all that's available, six months life is better than having the truck sitting in the yard. What we found is that one of the issues that Cummins was having is fuel tubes, which is a, a metal tube that goes in the injector and you, you can't, they crush when you put them together. So it's a one time only, you have to have new, they can't supply them and they don't know when they could. So we actually decided to manufacture them ourselves in our own plant. And now we can include them with our reman injectors. So um, it, there are opportunities out there and it just depends on, as you guys were saying, the vendor, um, it, when you're starting to get substandard components, obviously it's going to affect the longevity of your finished good. Um, so, you know, our warranties have not changed regardless of where the stuff comes from. It's 24 months with unlimited mileage, but that's part of who we are as a vendor, not necessarily the quality issues that we're going to run into in the next, you know, couple of years. And and you're you you guys are talking about the flip side of the coin, right? On the one hand, you got to watch out for for low quality products, but on the other hand, and Adam kind of alluded to this, there there's some really great innovative companies out there that aren't in the tier one big brand name companies, but they make fantastic products. This is their chance. This is their yeah. chance to step up, yes, and this is their chance to get some exposure that they never would have otherwise gotten without the situation as it is. And I'm getting hit up. I'm getting hit up every day on LinkedIn. Uh, all these vendors, just like we're talking about, they're they're calling, they're wanting, and I'm passing it on to our purchasing department, which does a fabulous job of maintaining through this crisis. I mean, it's happening every day. I mean, my LinkedIn, I've never been hit by so many different manufacturers or different components that we dealt with. But again, we still stand firm at the end of the day that we sell quality product because when the customer brings it back because it failed, that doesn't look good on the company. Uh, Keith, you guys took uh, a very direct approach to dealing with this. And I think in that, um, when, when you set up your task force, there's a lesson there that even a fleet that has a procurement department or a repair shop that has a procurement department, uh, they could they could take some lessons away from that. Can you just tell us a little bit about what you did with the task force and, and the benefits that it brought to your company by taking that proactive approach once you saw things were, were shifting? Well, actually, it's... Uh... Uh, that's kind of a, a big word for our, our company, but actually I came from the world that uh, took about three or four meetings before you can make a decision. Um, <laughs> but now the great thing is, is, you know, the senior management team here, we sit down uh, at least once a month, if not, but the purchasing team, they're constantly every day talking to each other back and forth. So they are seeing what's coming ahead and they're already starting to look at, a different avenue in order to be able to prepare for that that stop sign that's coming. So we all stay in touch in all aspects of the business. So if we see something that's occurring in the service department with a shortage, that's relayed throughout everybody else, whether it's the parts guys, we have a process we use through our, our system that we utilize here that the counter guys can alert our purchasing department as well. So it's constant conversation and communication throughout the company. And so that's been the saving grace and the great communication factor for us here is it's a constant everyday process, but the senior team sits down and goes through this in a BI type uh, breakout that we've started doing now. So communication is the factor to, to succeeding through the storm. Yeah, and maybe in the past, some inefficiencies could be overlooked because, you know, we just didn't have that pressing need. But right now, uh, a small oversight can have a big impact three or three weeks later. Absolutely. I mean, even down to our delivery drivers uh, have come back in and, and made the comment that such and such uh, fleet or repair shop says, hey, they can't find this part. And it's it brings opportunities. And when you can prevail for your customers that just enhances their loyalty to you to come back to you for the first call next time. Uh, Greg, you deal with a lot of different distributors. So when you're evaluating a distributor, what are the kinds of, of best practices you're looking to see that they have in place, which tells you this is someone that uh, a fleet or a repair shop could trust to sell your product? Well, that's a good question. Um, the quality aspect of it, um, we're probably not the cheapest guy on the block. Um, we have probably the, the, the most robust all-makes injector program that anybody does. 
Um, so we're looking for somebody who is um, that kind of uh, not everything to everybody. I mean, there's got to be somewhat of a niche um, when you're looking at it, um, especially when you get into the e-commerce. You know, you could be selling to anybody. Um, so if I'm selling to distributors and those distributors are basically carrying my name or I private label for them, there's there's got to be the quality aspect that they're looking for. Um, and that because we do so much with the military and the inspections that we keep up with, you know, we don't have a problem. I'm, our our warranty rate is so low that people can't believe it. Um, and it's because we have inspectors on the plant all the time. So I'm really looking for people who are going to be honest and forthright and the quality type of distribution that we're looking for. Right. So it matches what uh, you're bringing to the market. Adam, we're just coming to uh, the end of our time here. Did you have anything else you wanted to add to this part of the discussion? Yeah. So something that we've done, we meet on Tuesdays. We've every Tuesday we've got our purchasing. My brother's does all the purchasing, been doing it for 25 years, stress to the max. So I've tried to take as much off his plate as possible. He gives me a list of parts and then I go and try and hunt them down. So what we've really found out is, you know, you every every one of our you know distributors, just like us, we we deal with the the auto mans, the the triangle suspensions, the Daytons of the world, and a lot of these guys and more, they'll they'll carry multiple brands. So, for instance, shocks. So you can get a Monroe shock from Monroe, but you can also get that from Triangle, and you can also get it from Dayton. So if if Monroe's out you can check to at least two other places that, you know, you're direct with, or most people are direct with to get that same part. It might be a different price, but at least they'll have it. Same thing. Automan, you know, Automan has AppSco where we buy AppSco parts, you know, so yeah, that's I think another, they've got Gabriel shocks too, don't they? They've got Gabriel they shocks. Yeah, yeah. So, so we, we buy all of our Gabriel shocks through them just from a convenience factor of not having another supplier to buy from. So he does his auto man order, adds some Gabriel shocks on top of it. You know, if, if they're out of the shock, then we go look at Gabriel and just buy it there. So there's multiple sources to where you can get and buy that part from that's already within your distributor network. Sometimes you just got to dig a little bit to see, you know, Hey, they've already, they're already offering this part. I don't need to go aftermarket with something, I can just buy it from my existing supplier. Okay. Um, we have a question that came in around diesel emission uh, systems parts or after treatment parts. Do either of you sell those parts, Keith or Adam? We do. Okay. Adam, what is your uh, preferred manufacturer of those parts uh, when it, when you're looking at it from a high quality perspective? Who's giving you the best quality parts right now? Um, I mean, quality is, I mean, we're, we try and go, you know, as, as high quality as we can. We go with, with uh, Dynex a lot. We're going with, um, drawing a blank on it now, but we, we've got multiple suppliers. We have a local supplier that's in Des Moines that we buy some parts from as well. Clamps and, and uh, docks and, and DPFs from. Uh, so we, we have multiple sources and we go out and, and a lot of times what we do is we'll sample almost these parts to some of our our good partners and and say hey tell us what you think of this you know this is a partner that we're thinking about dealing with um so we've got multiple sources for that we haven't really gone away from any of these sources that we've been buying from so far um but you know i, I think it's more of a trial and error type yeah, well, I think I can I can help uh, uh, Rick out a bit too. Um, so there's two manufacturers that I know that do a really good job. Redline Emissions Products, uh, they're out of Redding, California. Uh, they put put out a very high quality product. Uh, full disclosure, they're a client of mine. Another one is Global Emission Systems, uh, Jesse. Um, they're doing a, a pretty good job. There, there's a Canadian connection there with with me, um, but they're not a client of mine directly. Uh, but We've done some co-branded content and stuff like that together because they've been very proactive. Uh, one thing that Global has done a really good job of is really helping their distributors. So they're really proactive with their distributors as the manufacturer. They're out in the field with them. They're helping them promote their businesses and and they're putting forth a, a quality product as well. So Rick, there's a couple options. Uh, find find a distributor. Uh, Redline has over 66 distributors in the U.S. and Canada alone. Um, so you should be able to find a distributor of their product. You can go to uh, rep.direct. 
is uh, is their website. So there's a couple options. All right, gentlemen. And I would this- also say, Jamie, that um, you know, part of this whole thing, we've actually developed a, a complete line of EGR uh, coolers um, mm-hmm. that we're just launching now, and it's all because of the shortages and. And generally what we try and do is take the failure mode into account when we remand and make the remand better than what the new was. And with yeah. EGR coolers, that's not hard to do because they're all too small and too fine and come apart too easy. So depending on the, the, the product that you're looking for on the emission side of it, um, DPFs they're having a lot of problems with in the northern areas where they're, um, they're, they're, they're calcifying up the urea is, um, it becomes like calcium. And so, that's another thing we're looking at, EGR valves and uh, the injectors, which AMBAC actually has the original patent for the DPF injector that we sold the patent rights 15 years before anybody even made one. Um, so we kind of screwed up on that one. <laughs> it, it's kind of funny how um, there are a lot of opportunities that are cropping up because of this situation. I actually was at a BMW dealer the other day to pick up a part for my car and there was like four new BMWs on the lot, and that was it. So that has to transfer over into the heavy-duty market at some point in time. Um, so a couple of years down the road, I, the, the remand end of it and all of the, the repair business does much better when new is not available. So there's going to be an upswing, at least for the short term, for all of the aftermarket stuff. Yeah, and of course, one of the sponsors of this whole event, Alliant Power, um, they have a what they call an OEM aftermarket uh, line. So they have a complete after treatment line as well, and they have such deep connections with OEM manufacturers that if you want a really good quality product, then um, then Alliant Power's got a, a line that you should look at as well. So there's definitely a lot of options. Those are some some of the things that we can uh, you know we can recommend. Um, so we got a different kind of question. One last question here. Uh, Malintech is a manufacturer. We're looking for some manufacturer representatives for diesel parts. Can you re- recommend some manufacturer reps? I think that's a question we'll take uh, offline, Steve. If you can reach out to us directly, we'll talk about that. Um, but I wanted to just kind of conclude our conversation right now to say thank you very much to each one of you for participating. You, you all come with tremendous amount of experience. So Greg, Thanks for representing manufacturers for us today. Well, you're very welcome. And uh, Keith, thank you so much for for coming in. You you know you you have a perspective and so many years of of experience. I really appreciate you sharing what you've been doing with your company and how you've been managing this difficult time. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Jamie. And just uh, we use the slogan: be uh, proactive and not reactive. Hundred percent. And Adam, uh, I, I'm truly impressed by your company's proactive approach with uh, your digital sales channel now going on over a decade. Um, you know, sometimes you got to put in the work ahead of time and then you reap the, the benefits downstream. So certainly uh, congratulations on all of your success. And uh, we, uh, we thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Appreciate it. It was fun being here. And most importantly, everybody who listened in, thank you so much for you uh, watching this presentation and thank you to Alliant Power and Diesel Laptops. We'll talk to you again soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching this video. Click here to subscribe to the Heavy Duty Parts Report YouTube channel and click here to watch another great episode.